Hmm. It seems we are on air. So welcome everybody to today's webinar, Safe Digitalization Through Intellectual Property from Europe to the World, which is brought to you by ZAPI, IP Business Academy, the EU Japan Technology Transfer Help Desk, and of course, the International IP SME Help Desk, where we're going to learn about the services we offer for those of you who don't know us still of course also analyze the digitalization of a traditional company from the ip perspective and also discuss some ip specs that must be considered if you plan to go to mexico or myanmar maybe china vietnam india or brazil okay i know i know what you're thinking such an ambitious agenda couldn't be covered unless you'll have the best team you can get, which is the case today. And I have, as you can see, a very good team with me. I'm well accompanied by a bunch of top experts. We have Professor Dr. Alexander Vlitsa, Director of IP Management Education at ZAPI and Director of Research Programs at IP Business Academy. We also have Tobias Denk, um, from also from IP ZAPI IP Business Academy, and he is a program coordinator Lucas Kofier, project manager at the EU Japan Technology Transfer Help Desk. And also Savarjit Patil is a patent engineer at electronics, machinery, and software departments at Sonoda and Tobayashi. Jim Stuppen, project manager of the China IP SME Help Desk, and all our IP SME Help Desk IP advisors. Matthias Tobimendi for China. Benoit Tardy for Southeast Asia and Girish Samwarbet for India. My name is Cesar Fernandez, IP advisor at the Latin America IP SME Help Desk, and today also your humble moderator. So this will take us approximately 90 minutes, um, where I'd like you to react, of course, and share and ask, and as much as you want, of course. So please let use let's use the chat tab to comment what you feel like. And if you have some queries, just write them in the question tab and we will address them during the Q&A session, which will take place at the end of the webinar, okay? And with that said, let's get into it. Jim Stuckman is delivering the first appetizer. Jim, welcome. Thank you very much, Cesar. Um, and welcome to everyone to join this uh, this fantastic training. Uh, again, a great collaboration with the uh, the international IP help desks, um, as well as the Center for International Intellectual Property Studies. Um, we've obviously collaborated many times in the past, and today, before we go into really the expert talks, um, it's also good for for us to briefly highlight the services that we offer, which obviously go beyond the training that we offer today and which allows you also to understand how after this training, you can continue to make use of our services um, as a company or as a business support organization, whether it's on the nexus between digitization and intellectual property or any other sector or industry, um, we are there really to help you. So without further ado, um, my name is Jim Stopman. I'm the project manager of the China IP SME Help Desk, and I'll be presenting a very few slides on the services of the IP help desks. As you can see from this image, um, the IP SME help desks cover a wide variety of geographical regions. The European Commission established the help desks um, quite a number of years ago when they came to realize that IP remains a very complex issue for many small and medium enterprises. Um, and in order to support them and give them the tools to make more informed and strategic decisions, uh, they es established these free support services really geared towards supporting SMEs and giving them the insights and the tools to make better decisions on IP. As you see here, we cover China, which is uh, greater China, including Taiwan, Hong Kong and Macau, Europe, India, Latin America, Southeast Asia, as well as Africa, which was recently joined the gang of intellectual property help desks. Who can make use of our services? So our services, as I mentioned, are really geared towards SMEs, SMEs from the European Union, but also Cosme SMEs, which is a, 
a cooperation agreement that the European Union has with various countries um, in the Balkans, for example, also in North Africa, um, to support these countries as well, um, Turkey, for example, and support companies and SMEs in those countries as well with the services that we offer. So it's not only European Union member states, but also a number of other countries that can make use of our free services. In addition to that, we um, strategically aim our services as well to EU innovation stakeholders and multipliers, relying on these organizations because of their network with SMEs, startups, and smaller companies. So we heavily rely on these multipliers to, to reach and sort of cast the widest net possible amongst the SME community. So if you are a multiplier or a business support organization listening into this uh, training, feel free to reach out to all of us. Um, we're very keen to help. What do we do? Um, again, just a very short summation. We provide free of charge first line confidential assistance on IP protection management, but also on enforcement. So in case there's an infringement in any of the regions that I've just shown, um, we also do provide advice on uh, potential avenues for um, enforcing your IP rights. Um, so keep this in mind um, when reaching out to us and making use of our services that it's pretty holistic in uh, in terms of what we what we offer if we look at the specific services um, i think they can be divided in sort of five main strands um, first of all is the inquiry helpline so this is really sort of a physical email address a physical area where smes and startups researchers can send us any questions they have of pertinence to intellectual property. They can be very basic questions going from how much does it cost to register a trademark in Brazil uh, or in Ghana to more complex issues related to tech transfer or contracts, for example. Um, and your questions will be answered within three working days. So this is a very key element of the services that we offer, the inquiry helpline. We provide training workshops obviously during the COVID area, mainly online. And this is a great example of what we do. Um, often working again with business intermediaries and support organizations to try and reach as many small companies as possible. Um, if you're interested to organize one of those trainings with us, again, don't hesitate to reach out. Webinars, again, sort of falling within the scope of what we're doing today. We have a, a new website um, with various blog articles and basically a huge repository of information regarding intellectual property. I'll share the link to our website in the chat in a moment um, so that you can browse that website uh, at a time of your convenience. And the website is full of guides and fact sheets on any topic, any industry, whether it's trademarks, patents, trade secrets, um, textile and fashion industry, um, artificial intelligence and industry 4.0. We have such a wide um, amount of information available that I strongly recommend you to go and check it out. Again, the main element, I think very important, we are there to support you. Write us with any questions that you might have. Also today in the question box, as Cesar mentioned, don't hesitate to answer a question, ask questions and you'll receive a reply within three working days. And if you ask the question today in the question box, we'll obviously cover your questions today. Very important also to uh, follow us on the, the, the socials, the social media. Um, here you see some of our handles on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, as well as the URL to our website. Um, it's very good for you to follow us because it um, allows you to stay updated on key developments in the field of IP in the regions that we cover. Um, but it also allows you to stay abreast of any of the events that we're organizing on a wide variety of topics, obviously allowing you to join and to learn more about intellectual property. Um, that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions later on today during the Q&A if, um, if required. Uh, and without further ado, I would give the floor back to our moderator, Cesar, and uh, wish you a fantastic training today. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, you are all aware of that. See you later during the Q&A session. Hope there's tons of questions about this help desk. As said, you have the link on the chat. So if you want to know more about this help desk, just go check it and see how can you benefit from all what we offer. So thank you very much. I know, I know 
you all may be missing one more help desk because we spoke about India, China, Southeast Asia, um, Latin America, and also Africa, by the way. But where is Japan? You may be wondering. Well, uh, of course, Jim didn't mention that because this is exactly what Lucas Coffier is here for. So welcome, Luca. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cesar. Thank you to everyone, all the colleagues that are with me today. I'm sorry. Things happen, mm -hmm. but he's back, but he's back. Now, unfortunately, we can hear now, unfortunately, you. we can hear you, look. Your headphones were really okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. I have some problems with that. Anyway, so thanks again, uh, Cesar, for hosting this, all the colleagues from all the other help desks, of course, uh, in Prince, the, uh, all the attendees for joining us today, and also the partners from, uh, from Sonal and Kobayashi that are uh, together presenting the help desk with me from Japan. As Cesar said, we are out of the first help desk that you saw. We are coming from uh, a different uh, kind of history, but we are all related. We are very excited and happy to, to work with the, with the other colleagues from the, from the other help desk. And this is not the first time, as Cesar mentioned, and also Jim prior to, uh, to me, in which we did something together. And this will not, of course, be the last time as well. Let me talk about uh, Japan for uh, a couple of minutes and introduce you what we do. So I will follow this super brief presentation, the following topics, just a very quick description of the help desk and the services in general. Then I will go deep down and talk about the uh, database of available technologies that we have, the uh, section dedicated to the request for proposals, the IPR support program, and how to get in touch with the help desk and specific of course with myself here you see the slide that we say push approach pull approach for those that are not that familiar maybe with this terminology and technology transfers it means we help technology owners in pushing their technologies towards the market and also those that are seeking for new technologies to find technologies from the market okay and i will show you in a, in a minute how we we try to do that so let me go back to the history of the of the help desk we uh, started this service in February, March of 2016 after, um, let's say, uh, a report, a study that we made on technology transfer specifically from university, from academia to, uh, to industry. But then we decided to, of course, expand the service to all kinds of stakeholders and also, uh, of course, cover both the EU and, uh, and Japan. And actually, also in my case, like Jim mentioned earlier, we cover cosmic countries as well. Uh, we do have a website, of course, uh, and uh, before COVID and after COVID, of course, we will go back to the ordinary normal operations. And so it would be my pleasure to host also clients uh, that are visiting me in the office in Tokyo, even though today I'm talking to you from, uh, from Europe. Uh, we, uh, we have a website here that will be mentioned again uh, later, and I can also share with you in the chat, so don't worry about that if you miss it now. This is the uh, homepage of the website of the help desk, where you find, as you can see from the very beginning, uh, the most important tool, which is a search uh, that allows you to look for not just uh, patented or patent pending technologies, but also available technologies. What is the difference between, between these categories? Available technologies in this database concern and are related only and exclusively to technologies owned mostly by academia and research institutions that are available for licensing and that are either patented or with a patent pending. Okay, so it's not just what is existing out there that you can look for, it's not just what can be protected with a patent or with an application that is pending, but what is available. So you can actually call me or the uh, universities and research institutions that you see 
from the website and you can inquire and ask whether a technology is still available for licensing purposes. This is how usually uh, things look like. So you can enter a profile of an institution, you can see what the institution is and the kind of technologies that they are promoting. Uh, I have to warn you, not all of the technologies of these institutions are posted on my website. When originally we asked to create files, we asked to uh, universities and research institutions to post, let's say, the at the time, the most attractive technology, the ones for which they thought that they could be uh, kind of a really good potential for licensing purposes, okay? Uh, but anyway, be aware and keep in mind that there are way more technologies in the uh, relevant portfolios of the institutions that are on the website. Uh, usually, there is always a description with the potential applications, potential limitations, if known, and then, of course, there is a description also with the readiness level, the TRL, that uh, and let you understand how far or close the technologies is to the to the market. Okay. Usually, technologies that are on the website coming from academia and research institutions are at TRL level number four, uh, whose definition is a technology that is validated in a lab and then needs to be further developed. Okay. Uh, the result breakdown that you see when you make a search of the database are first the uh, technologies that are in my database then the ones of the universities that are connected to the, to the database of the center of the help desk then you have a second layer with the en uh, database only with the tech offers uh, then you have jstor that is a database from japan and academic labs that is uh, a startup uh, that we've been working on for now a couple of years from europe that is providing uh, as access to uh, their database of uh, scientific literature and patent documents and go on. And then the last, very last layer is the top 10 technologies from WIPO database, the intellectual property organization. And, uh, um, and then we have access to uh, the global database of uh, patent documents. So patent applications and patents that allows you to have kind of a quick as an action of how is the situation. You can also have, uh, you can see some charts with the top filers, so you can see where things are going, some kind of trends, okay? This is how uh, usually uh, you see a result breakdown. So you have the different databases that I just described. You can just click on them and then be redirected. If they are hosted by different websites, you will be prompted to the website that is relevant to your search. This is the kind of uh, example from the uh, academic labs. Uh, website that allows you to have access, as you can see, to a lot of different sources, tech offers, services, tenders, projects. So you can really have a very good view of what's going on in a specific technology sector, and then you can reach out to scientists, to professors, and, and maybe ask for more information if, if need be. Okay. The, we talk about the, the push approach. Now let's talk about the, the pull from January 2018 we incorporated on the website this new uh, feature that allows usually companies to come to me and say, look, we are looking for researchers, we are looking for scientists that can solve this problem. They are working on this line of research uh, and we are looking for either a patent or uh, a, just a patent application or just a research that is about to be published but not yet published. So together with the companies, with my clients, we create uh, requests for proposals, RFPs, and then I reach out to uh, specific targets. If the company the clients are asking me to reach out to specific uh, entities, or it can be something that we published online. Okay, so, it really, so if you're interested also in this kind of activities, because you're looking for a technology that you don't want to develop from scratch, there is no need sometimes to bring in the wheel, please be in touch and maybe I can help you out with that. Uh, these are examples of how uh, we do create uh, RFPs on our own. Or of course, we repost RFPs, like in this case, of our partners. The, let me almost basically get to the end of my short presentation with the IPR support program. This is also another service that we implemented in 2018, coincidentally, uh, exactly with Sonobi Kobayashi, that today is also with us. Uh, and you will hear from uh, from our speaker from uh, Sarv later on today. And we started this program to help our clients in having a 
confidential, complementary first talk to uh, the patent lawyers that are in the agents that are in, uh, in Japan. And also actually we added other firms, so we also are linked to firms in Europe uh, for a first initial consultation. So all the kind of questions that you heard from, from Jim earlier are exactly the same questions you might have about Japan and we'll be happy to, to help you out. This is how to get in touch with me, but anyway, don't worry. I will uh, rewrite everything in the chat window so that you miss, you don't miss anything. Thanks again for being with us today. Uh, thanks to all my colleagues at the attendees. Thanks to Cesar, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas. See you again during the Q&A session. And finally, we got some contrast to these exotic tastes we introduced, and it's Tobias Denk which is going to let us know more about ZP IP Business Academy. Welcome to BS. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cesar and Luca and Jim. Uh, and also thank you for the opportunity to present here one of our case studies from the IP Business Academy. So um, first, um, I, I want to introduce myself. So I'm Tobias Denk. I'm the program coordinator at the IP Business Academy. And I want to show you shortly where you can, uh, where you can find us. Um, what uh, we are doing and, and who we are. So um, what the IP Business Academy is doing, so we are running the academic IP management programs at SAPI. Um, SAPI is the European Center for International Intellectual Property Studies at the University of Strasbourg. And on this slide, I want to show you um, where you find us. So this is the web page of the SAPI, sapi.edu. And in the left tab, um, there is the box training in IP management. And behind the box, you can find all the different programs that we are currently offering. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, there you can find all the current information. Um, the, the top um, box there is the Master of Intellectual Property Law and Management. This is a master's program that is offered yearly from January to June. And now we're in the 16th year of that master program. So it's one of the longest running IP management programs that are currently offered worldwide. And additionally to that program, you see the next two uh, offers that we have um, since 2019. We also have uh, distance learning courses in um, IP management. So there are two courses offered, a certificate and a diploma course. I want to show you on the next slide the topics that we are currently offering. So there are eight different um, certificate courses with these eight different topics um, available until the end of the year. So you can either choose to focus on one of that specific topics and get there a degree, or you can also take the whole course with all that eight topics and get a university diploma at the SAP. Uh, the special thing with that courses is that they are targeted at uh, non-IP professionals, so especially um, people at SMEs um, who want to have some practical knowledge about IP that they need to know in their job. So the courses are all set up in a way that you get the necessary theoretical knowledge about IP that you need in your position, but they are always offered with uh, practical case studies so that you can really apply the cases uh, with cases from um, the, the knowledge with cases from your industry and that you really know um, what is important in your job and that you have also an application of the theory in the practice. And um, additionally to that, like you see today, we're not hiding our case studies and our material. So we are also running um, blog um, on ipbusinessacademy.org and a LinkedIn page. So there you can find all the case studies that we are using in our um, academic programs. You can get the teaching materials. You can get um, access to blog posts from our experts about all the topics that we are teaching about. So um, all areas from um, uh, the connection between intellectual property and innovation and intellectual property and digitalization. Um, the material on the blog and the LinkedIn are all freely accessible. And uh, additionally, on LinkedIn, we are organizing regular interviews with uh, either the lecturers of our courses or the students, the alumni and other experts who are explaining um, the current situation of IP management. So um, there you get an information on what is really going on right now in the industry, what you 
should know about IP management and there you also have an opportunity to exchange with the, the lecturers and the students or to connect and to ask additional questions. So finally, uh, regarding questions, if you have any questions about uh, this, you can also contact me directly, write me an email. So the contact is tobias.dank at ipbusinessacademy.org. And yeah, um, now I, I want to hand back to Cesar and then Professor Wurzer, who can show you one of the cases that we are dealing with in our programs. So thank you for the attention. And <laughs> thank you very much, Tobias. Now that we all warmed up, I think it's time for a little bit of workout. So see you again during the Q&A session. But now it's time for something a little bit bigger, now a little bit stronger. And this time it will be Professor Wurzer who's going to explain a very interesting case study about IP in the fourth industrial revolution, and particularly the role of intellectual property in the digitalization process of a traditional company, and particularly in the agricultural sector. So I think this is the best way to understand the real impact of intellectual property at a business level, as Tobias said. But should you not agree please let us know in the comments. And if you have any question, because after the presentation, you don't feel that everything was as clear as you expected, this is what the Q&A session is for. But I don't have to say anything more about this. It is Professor Welcome for, welcome to this webinar. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you for having me, for giving me the floor to show a little bit what some of our experiences are, our findings, um, uh, in our cooperation with uh, different industry partners and the EPO. So we, we have here a, a very interesting study. Uh, we see the, the gray line here and the, the gray line tells us that we had a growth of around 200% of patent filings over the last 20 years at the EPO. And um, the interesting curve is the, the, the turquoise one, because it tells us that over the last 20 years, we see a growth of 1,400% um, in for digital uh, patents. So patents which, which patent digital solutions like use cases, apps, uh, customer journeys, um, uh, business models, ecosystem positions, whatever. And um, so to a certain extent, that are objects which people might think they cannot be patented because they have heard sometimes uh, uh, software cannot be patented. So these, these patents don't patent software per se, yeah, because this is not accepted. But as soon as you load the software on a computer and, and solving with the broadest meaning a technical problem, of course, this is using of a technical mean to solve a technical problem, and that means uh, you get your patent. Um, the question is, where comes the idea for that patent? So, um, what exactly does uh, it covers? So that is what we what we do our research on, our trainings, and our cooperation with the industry over the last fifteen years. The role of IP. Uh, within the digital transformation. And especially agriculture is a fascinating field because uh, some people think that, you know, it's it's maybe boring or, or not that fancy or sexy like, like Netflix or, or other um, uh, platforms, uh, streaming platforms. But, but it, it, the opposite is true, that especially in the, in the agriculture, we need efficiency. This is one of the most efficient sectors around the globe. And... Um, and there we can really learn what industry 4.0 or or digital transformation means and we 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 have a we have the the term smart farming we have the term precision farming um and uh, what we see here over the years is also the growth of patent applications very specific what we have here considered different soil conditions and adapted fertilization and sowing. So just that field, we, we see in 2018 around 400 applications just to, for the question, um, what exactly are the soil conditions? Okay, and how can we adapt uh, fertilization and sowing uh, to that condition. I mean, that 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 is precision farming. That means we want to know out there what's going on and we want to optimize uh, here the production situation. Um, when we switch to the next slide, I can explain you a little bit 
Uh, Cesar, could you switch? To, uh, I, I'm doing that. Right, right, right. I'm doing that. Sorry. When we switch to the next slide, we can we can see how the digital transformation is running, and we can see that on the on, on, on the example of the agriculture industry. So the first point is always the, the starting phase, so to speak, is the digitization of the machine. Um, so we call that digitization, this, this, this phase. So that means that we use, so we have a physical machine, we have physical transactions. So you buy a machine for using it, uh, like, a, like a combined harvester from Glass. So Glass is one of our case studies. And, but this machine has sensors and actuators and is, has, a, has a connectivity um, uh, to the cloud. And we, the, the digital um, layers are there to um, to to give the machine enhanced functionalities. Okay, so the, the machine can do more, um, is more efficient. So that's 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 the, the the role also of the patents here. So the patents um, protect these enhanced functionalities of the machine. But we talk about a machine and transaction oriented business models. So the next phase is the digitization of the environment of the machine. So now we talk about processes. So that's that's here on top. We see not just the machine. We see that this harvester um, is dumping the corn um, here into into the lorry, and these two vehicles are coordinated. Um, this is a rendezvous, and during the harvesting, we see this 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 colorful. Um, landscape, the machine sensors collect data for the next step, let's say for fertilization uh, uh, in the next year and so on. So, which means the, 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 this digitalization of the environment tells us that we, um, <clears throat> that we don't talk about isolated machines anymore. Now the patterns are about interfaces, data exchange, uh, the optimum the data models of processes it's about efficiency enhancement during production processes that is that is what what we do now here and the patents are not about isolated machines we talk about the whole process landscapes and how we create the efficiency there but still we run transaction oriented business model in that phase which means you sell machines and then you have to run the processes to, produ to produce, for example, corn. So in the third phase, this is then the digital transformation, or we call it digitization of the ecosystem. So now on, on top of that, we have all that uh, interconnected machinery, we have all that processes on plenty of farms, and now we can start completely new business models and now we we need the so like farm net so that which means now we try to optimize the efficiency of farms the productivity of the whole farm with all processes which run there and we have also connectivity to other players um uh, like the producers of fertilizers for example and um, now we the patterns are about a curation of data uh, in that ecosystem and, for example, interoperability of all the players they're in. So we come from isolated machines, we go to processes, and now we have ecosystems. And, um, and now we see new business models which are about, um, uh, uh, which, which, which are um, based on an interaction, on a continuous relationship. And not just on transactions, which means you get a fertilizer, you get the fertilizer, I get the money. Here we have a continuous interaction and relation. So, and um, we can explain that very well with a relatively simple model. It, it is that layer model which was developed 2000, also published 2015. That's quite old. And um, we have here the good old physical layer. So this is, let's say, the tractor. And then we have sensors and actuators on it and connectivity and analytics and digital services. So we go the whole bottom up, we go the whole ladder on top and we, we, we have the internet of things here, which means um, we have uh, the opportunity to run different business models based on that physical yeah. layer. And a wonderful example comes from John Deere yeah. and this, um, this power on demand or functionality on demand thing. 
So when we analyze the patent portfolio, so what exactly patent John Deere? And uh, when we look at it, we see that they have patents for the quick. So the other way around, we, the, the starting point is that, that farmers buy a tractor. And when they buy the tractor, they are not willing to pay for all and every gadgets which such a tractor can be equipped today okay so want to, they want to save money or they okay maybe i don't need that i don't know whether i need it but when they are out on the field and they have a certain certain challenge and they know that a tractor can um cope with it can is is able to do it but unfortunately they had not bought they, they did not bought it then they can go back with this cream with this cream which is integrated in the tractor and they can buy in the tractor during they use the tractor they buy the functionality so the tractor is adapting now download that functionality or at least not download just just make it available because it was already there but uh, the farmer had no access to it so now the access is to the functionality and john deere has a relationship okay john deere sees now that the um, a farmer needs that functionality and they offer in addition services consultancy based on that functionalities. So, which means we have on top of the physical and sensor and connectivity layers, we have new business models, which can be um, created, um, for example, here for the farmer. So, and the, the interesting fact is now that uh, analyzing tens of thousands of patterns, we see that within the digital transformation, only four different logics are applied again and again to create the business models and use cases and to patent them. So we have the data and information logic, which means we have the availability of data, which was not, which was not available before. And we have the enabling logic, which means we give you decision support. We enable humans or objects to make better decisions in terms of um, ahead of you is a traffic. So from the navigation system, you know that ahead of you is a, is a traffic jam. Uh, you should go out of the motorway. So here, the system enables human to make better decisions. Um, the same thing uh, is done with objects uh, like uh, the, 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 the system, which optimizes um, the corn processing within the corn tank of a, of a harvester. Then, then we have simulation and mapping logic, which means this is the, the determination of the estimated time of arrival in the navigation system. So when will you arrive or in the agriculture? So you should speed up with the, with the harvesting speed um, and, and, and you should use more diesel um, to make that because the weather is changing. Okay, so simulation and mapping logic. And then we have a networking logic, which brings two network partners together or more than two, uh, which had no connectivity before and did not know the information before. So, and um, this, this left side that leads to efficiency gains in horizontal and vertical networks, and the right side leads to better decisions. It enhances the effectiveness and the right side is for pricing uh, um, for price premiums and the left side is for lowering costs so and we use these different technologies like assistance systems uh, information preference systems cyber physical systems iot data models system architectures we use that technology which is existing of course as an infrastructure to realize that digital use cases. And um, I would like, I have a little movie and I would like to show you that movie. So I could, could you help me with the movie? So what we see here are these four different approaches, how um, IP is used um, to, uh, to create business uh, use cases yeah so we have the determination of the optimal driving route through the field and here we have a level detection of the grain container so which means we know when will be the tank full and when we have to dump the tank and uh, we can calculate uh, the route and the precise precision where this dumping should happen and here we have an automated unloading procedure of an harvester so these kind of patterns, um, uh, machine coordination, uh, this is an enabling of objects to make smarter processes. 
and we have direct benefits here in the business model like optimal coordination coordination of workflows reduction uh, of the workload for the, the the drivers and so on so now we have the determination of the quality of the corn which is given to the cloud and um, to the silo to prepare the silo processes we have the simulation of moving harvesters to avoid conflict situations on the field we have the predicting and monitoring uh, of growth on soil information and this is now the next logic which i explained this is the vertical networking and we have again the direct benefits within the business models like automatization of documentation obligations or reducing of costs optimal use, utilization of capital investment equipment. Um, we have better decisions under time constraints. Um, so and now we, we switch to the next scene. So now we have the controlling and regulation of, of fertilizer and, um, uh, and the simulation of an optimal travel path uh, of this vehicle across when they, when they make the sewing and um, uh, or when we make the fertilization so map-based fertilization system for example again going to the cloud goes for example to the chemical industry where we need that data to optimize an individual uh, fertilizer so recommendation of fertilizer mixture for example according to the weather condition according to the soil condition so this is now a horizontal networking uh, between different players in the whole ecosystem. We optimize the resource, the use of resources. We have real-time decision, real-time optimizations of what happens there. And then finally, uh, the, the thing is growing, the, the corn here. So um, we, we need, again, data from satellites, from drones, weather conditions. And we have here the determination of optimal cultivation, for example, method of optimal selection for sowing. Um, so now we, we make uh, the better decision for humans and we are then one round through the whole concepts prediction of fertilizer requirements um, for example or what we see here with the data so the corn is growing analysis of plants growing conditions prediction of harvest yields um, so the, the the whole situation is uh, covered and um, what we optimize here is we enable you humans to make better decision Okay, and we have, of course, these benefits in the custom in the um, in the business model, like real real time control and automated documentation. Okay, thank you very much. So, and when we look at that, and we don't we, we don't have to go through all the patterns. Okay, this is very well documented, presented, and and you can go through that uh, case study on on our blog. And um, I just want to to uh, show you that this is exactly what happens here. So we have assistance system. So the assistance system um, is here for a combined harvester. So this is the technology we enable humans to make better decision, and it is a data information logic and an enabling logic. So and we have, for example, here. Um, and vehicle also an assistance system and vehicle with defined uh, power on demand. So this is the patent as I explained to you from from John Deere. So and then we can go in this sector here, which is enabling objects. And for example, we have method for simulating, determining an effective method for working on agricultural areas. European patent, and this is using here cyber physical systems. We enable objects to make a smarter performance. And here on the lower left side, we have the vertical networking automat automatization pyramid. And this is method for coordinating um, uh, drivable agricultural machines. And finally, and here also a patent which type which is explained. And finally, upper left uh, corner, we have the horizontal networking value added network. For example, method for regulating and controlling agricultural centrifugal fertilizer spreaders. So, um, which means um, we have patent types for each kind of optimization. And when we use, when we apply these four logics 
the data and information logic, the enabling logic, the simulation and mapping logic and the networking logic. We use that four logics to optimize the impact of that used technologies in business models. And that is then patented. Okay, so this is one of the findings that in all of that tens of thousands of patents, we have just the types which uses that um, uh, which uses that logics and all these business models and use cases and customer journeys and apps around there. Um, and this, this is not just true for agriculture. This is true for each and every industry we analyzed um, that these four logics are used to optimize use cases and business models. And this is a very powerful thinking when we have a traditional use case like class harvesters and we ask the or John Deere yeah tractors and we want to optimize now um, this uh, according to the digitalization phases do we just think about isolated machines do we think about processes or do we think about ecosystems so that was what I wanted to tell you and um, it, it helps to to get a structure in an extremely uh, a confusing and complex field when we think in that way about IP or here especially patents to determine which which position and which patent exactly do we need to opt to cover our use case to cover our business model. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Borza. I think we all agree that when thinking of going to a lifestyle related to agriculture, one may be thinking that this is a simple lifestyle but it may be too complex maybe it's complex particularly it may be confusing also if you don't know how to handle this and of course you can compete and even make a living out of a very common life in a traditional based model but if you're gonna if you want to go and upgrade and take it to the next level intellectual property is really the key you know you spoke about patterns of course there's also copyrights involved you spoke about many data mining and which is software protection this is something that we're going to develop afterwards so thank you very much mr Wutza, for your contribution now i think that this ip strategy was simply brilliant and as you see um, this was based on a true story so it's been empirically proved that it really works but now, my question is, for a simple European small and medium-sized enterprise, is it really possible to implement this very same IP strategy abroad, meaning Latin America, India, China, and Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia as such? Or are there local differences that prevent from taking this very same protection path? For this, I have very well experts with me that i want them to join us so thank you very much mr Bota. i'm going to close this down and please you my beloved ip advisors turn your cameras on turn your mics on and let me know one simple thing is this really kind of implementable as such in the territories you covered short answer gentlemen Okay, yeah, please. Yes, it can be. It can be uh, protected in India. Cool. What about China? In the case of China, um, it is possible to follow the IP strategy. However, you will be required to yeah, request uh, administration permission from the government to use many of those technologies which are not technically speaking ip issues but it will impact on your final ip strategy okay yes but what about yeah, southeast asia i would say the same yes but it <laughs> depends on the, uh, every country because we're speaking of southeast asia so 10 countries yes mm. but yes but and what about japan then Oh, yes, I think uh, this could be implemented quite smoothly in Japan. Uh, the Japanese office is very, um, uh, very accepting of this kind of uh, digital technology, these kinds of patents. Yeah, actually, when I have the chance to see that Japan is absolutely different to the rest of the territories that we are covering today. So this was kind of tricky. And in case of Latin America, I'd agree with Benoit and Matthias. I'd say yes, but. And with but, I mean that, yeah, you're going to know 
you got to take into account that some things are different to the extent that you might even have to adopt a different business strategy. And this is exactly what I want to discuss today, actually, and the IP business aspects that differ and some other like, worth knowing IP related points. So you, our beloved audience, can currently decide what to do next. OK, so what could be our starting point? Um, I think and you may disagree or not, that it will be the mentality. Because when it comes to IP registration, for example, I see that many European entrepreneurs are kind of wearing the Europe glasses, so to say, and they expect similar standards everywhere. And thank God, of course, in Europe, entrepreneurs are very autonomous and have a strong, deep-rooted DIY culture. And of course, it is also very digital. And also, many experience a shocking contrast when they can simply not do that everywhere online. So this is what happened when it comes to prior such patterns, which is the first step. You want to got to know whether the invention you're taking out there is really new and hence protectable. So how can they check pattern availability? Obviously, on databases, but are they publicly available? Are they comprehensive? Are they free of charge? In the case of Latin America, for example, which is the territory I'm kind of covering today, you cannot have them all, okay? So you have to pick one or two at best, but how is it in the rest of the, in the territories, gentlemen? Well, in the case of China, it's, okay, it is again, it's done. <laughs> Okay, uh, starting off with uh, India. India has a comprehensive database on trademarks, uh, and everything is freely available trademarks, patents, and designs. Though I would just make a suggestion that uh, for participants that uh, the UI which is offered might not be very user friendly, but most of the databases are also present in the WIPO patent database, WIPO trademark database. So Anyone can access, uh, prior to going to India, making a patent search is an essential component and uh, the databases are freely available in India. Good to know. And Matthias, what is it about China? In the case of, yeah, in the case of China, it's also publicly available. The main difficulty for an EU company is the language barrier. Those, the Chinese patents are of course in Chinese language, which it's not so easy to, to analyze uh, for a EU SME. However, they are, if you have a, you have a speaker or a, that can do that research, or you can hire the services, you can afford to hire the services of a law firm that can at least uh, make a study and reduce the amount of, 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 of patents to analyze, it's possible. It is available, but again, the language barrier is a huge obstacle for the company. Mm -hmm. In Southeast Asia, we have a, a bit of the same issue. Uh, well, most of the IP offices of the 10 countries are now working efficiently. Uh, although, for example, Myanmar is still uh, like um, with some delays, the IP office. Um, we also have specificities regarding the local language, for example, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam. So it also uh, increases the difficulty for uh, IP owners to do, um, let's say, uh, uh, to have the full picture of prior rights. And this is also why it's always recommended for Southeast Asia uh, to pick a country and to refer to a local IP expert that will help you to understand also the results. Because you can do a search, but then you have also to an analyze uh, those uh, results. Hmm. So is this language is really a barrier in Japan too? It can be. Um, there is a very thorough database or patent register in Japan it's called the JPLAT PAT, which is kind of a mouthful, but a Japanese plat platform for patents. And it does have, um, it's been very thorough with all the documents, especially the older ones, but it's not exactly user friendly, especially for English speakers. So then you may struggle to find uh, um, some documents if you're not familiar with the Japanese. Um, 
sites like Google Patents, for example, they're actually very useful because they may have a lot, not all, but a lot of Japanese documents. And through that platform, you can quickly see if they're related documents in other languages, in other jurisdictions. And as well, I believe um, on the USPTO website through public dossier, you can um, get some automatic translations of certain uh, Japanese documents. I believe also uh, EU Space Net, you can also access some of the Japanese documents as well. So it's out there, but the language can be a little difficult. Oh, I see. So at uh, the end of the day, you kind of have this red light. You can have access to all of those documentation that would prove you that you are not novel, but not can prove you that you are real. So the, that someone did something before you, but you cannot be as clear as that when it comes to knowing whether you have a green light. So that everything you're checking is really what it's out there. So you're really sure about the novelty requirement. So at the end of the day, you have to rely on external IP experts, right? Well, this is a good news for the all of us because this is exactly what this help desk are for. But this also represents a kind of second um, barrier because it is also a must having as been what said, uh, to have appointed a local representative when it comes at least to registration? Or is it differently in your regions? How, and what's more important for the people who are listening to us right now, how could an European SME overcome this requirement in the most economical way? Are there any triggers for this? Hmm. Going with uh, India, uh, a local representative you, uh, one must have a local representative to file for a patent. Uh, I'm not sure there aren't any tricks. Uh, <laughs> uh, and But because all the filings can be done electronically, so European SMEs can file for patents and uh, trademarks online from Europe and just have one say a local representative, uh, uh, address of a local representative present in the application, filed through this means. So it can okay. be done electronically, but... Okay, so you can do yes. that, but um, you have to have kind of a local domicile, so you can really put in the local, in the local, e form. Local, uh, local domicile is needed. Okay, so, it, yes. so as in Latin America, what about Japan? Yes, in Japan, you're always free to represent yourself. Uh, however, of course, there are obvious obstacles to this, mainly being the language. You have to do it in Japanese. Um, there are rumors of the Japanese Patent Office starting an English prosecution program, but that's really uh, not on the table quite yet. And of course, uh, stylistically, every office does things a little bit differently. Um, in my experience, Japan isn't that different from Europe in their style of examination, but of course there are many differences as well. So if you really want the best examination you can possibly have, then you should rely on the expertise of people who work in Japan who are more familiar with the local practice. Okay, so you can do that online yourself from Europe, although you'll be facing these particularities that may represent an obstacle and maybe it's more cost efficient just to rely on an external expert. Am I right? Uh, yes, I would say so. Okay. And what about the rest of Southeast Asia? Matthias, don't run away. I want to have your opinion too afterwards. For Southeast Asia, well, it's uh, still very different from one country to the other, but the, um, let's say the, the major, major view is that you have to appoint a local representative, like in Latin America, I think, if you don't have any, uh, if you're not a resident of the country, or if you don't have any business uh, registered in the country, um, there are some more flexible countries like uh, Brunei or Singapore. And uh, it's good to mention that uh, when you are, for example, with a patent application, international patent application, there are um, translation also uh, required for specific countries like Thailand, Indonesia and Vietnam. So indeed, you either you speak perfectly the language or you have the technical knowledge. But at the end, it's always better. Uh, it was mentioned by Girish uh, when we were talking about something more technical that trademarks or designs. Uh, I think it's better to have uh, someone uh, like backing up locally. Yeah, always like in China, right? 
Exactly, and that's the case for for China as well. If you have an office here in China, you will be able to to do it by yourself. But again, you have the language barrier, especially for patents. It's a significant obstacle. So in practice, all companies end up hiring a local representative. And if you don't have any domicile in China, then you have no other choice. You have to hire an APH. Mm-hmm. So, and it is not just the language. There are some it, I, when you're trying to see whether your invention is really new. There's a huge amount of documentation you need to check, and but the same happens when those national intellectual property offices uh, offer you the services for you. So they perform these prior searches. Some uh, are uh, relatively free. Some you have to pay for them. But anyway, this is a huge task. How do these national intellectual property offices of yours respond to this? Do they have enough technical and human resources? Because already Benoit explained that uh, we are struggling. The COVID pandemic uh, brought some additional troubles. May that have served as an occasion for improvement? How is this working? Surprisingly, India has picked up a lot of speed, a lot of uh, pace in uh, Uh, prosecuting patent applications. So uh, over the past uh, couple of years, during the period of COVID, uh, Indian uh, Patent Office has done away with a lot of pending patents. And right now, the average time of patent uh, prosecution phase has come down to within two years, two to three years. So, and if you are an SME or a startup, uh, you can get your patent granted within 18 months, so which is really fast. Uh, so um, things are improving uh, and have improved a lot in with the uh, Indian Patent Office. Good news. Good news. And in Southeast Asia, Benoit, you opened I fire we, about this. I wish we could have the same speed <laughs> uh, as in India for startups. Uh, it's a bit this, the same, uh, even uh, 12 months uh, granting for Singapore under specific requirements. Uh, but uh, well, with COVID, we saw a lot of uh, um, staff, like half half of the staff uh, working in the IP office, more difficult to join them and discuss with them, uh, which is very important when you are trying to uh, settle uh, uh, the patent uh, registration. Uh, and uh, um, of, of course, uh, everything was switched virtually so most of the IP offices had to improve, and it was quite uh, a success for most of the countries. There's still, the let's say, the, the, go, the black sheep is uh, still Myanmar, but uh, they are experiencing some political issues. Uh, but now you can do a lot of actions, even regarding patents, online with the IP offices of Southeast Asia. Hmm. Matthias, what do you have to say about this? China is well, in- China is difficult, but it's improving. Uh, on average, for obtaining a patent, you can expect for, to wait from three up to six years. However, thanks to the last modification of the patent law, if there is any delay caused by the administration, you will be capable of exp- extending the life of the patent. So even though there's still a, a considerable amount of time to wait and there is a problem regarding the enforcement during that period of time because China did not recognize enforcement while the patent is pending, um, it is improving and the chance of expanding uh, the patent life at the end of the day will, will increase the, 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 how likely companies will be to, to register more and more patents. Mm-hmm. And Latin America happens kind of the same. They're doing their best, and countries like Brazil improved a lot. Um, they invested a lot if in in training people, so they have more trained personnel. They also signed some agreements, so they can really accelerate a little bit this stuff and invested in some technologies, these databases and tools that allow a little bit more efficient searches and and management in general. But there's still a lot to do again. And as you, uh, Benoit, already pointed out, the main consequence is that there's a significant backlog, okay? And this applies not only to patents, but all the IP rights. And generally speaking, we can say that they they all take longer to be registered. 
or maybe except in Mexico and Colombia, which are really, really fast and really close to the Europe, to the European standards. But Brazil is again one of the worst cases, I'm afraid, as a patent could take up to 10 years to be granted, and there's no duration protection extension, like Matias mentioned. So it's 20 years and that's it after the filing date. So after that, it becomes part of the public domain and your exclusivity is absolutely over. So, of course, it, it's really a big impact to your business plans because if you have to wait three or five or ten years to get your exclusive rights, your potential partners may not be that patient. So we all know that it takes a little bit longer and we all know that Japan is a little bit different. So what is the registration proceeding duration there? Is it that bad or is, is it that as good as we we think it is sarf well it's it's doing pretty well right now thankfully uh japan was not hit that bad by covid and japan over the years has slowly been speeding up year by year so right now the average time from filing uh the application to grant of the application is about 15 months which is mm -hmm. um you know I have no complaints about that whatsoever. I will say that part of the um, the reason for that is perhaps that it's not so convenient to continue, you know, uh, making minor amendments bit by bit and extending examination because after basically one or two rejections, you have to appeal. So you have more of an incentive to try to get that patent um, after the first or second round of office actions. But yes, things are moving along pretty fast, and for Design applications, it's about seven months. For trademark applications, it's about 11 months. So yeah, Japan is, uh, it's moving along pretty quickly right now. Yeah, you're, you're another level. You are another league. So we cannot compete. And there's no competition at all. Thank God. Um, yeah, there's significant backlog, but there are also so acceleration mechanisms, right? Um, that work as such. For example, in Latin America, we have the patent prosecution highway which is something that you can elaborate a little bit afterwards. And the something in Brazil, which is the green patent program. So if your invention has something related to the environment and it really protects to help the planet, uh, you'll be cut out from this up to 10 years to three years. So it's a significant um, acceleration that you can benefit from, but only if you comply with certain, certain conditions, of course. Um, like in Southeast Asia, you have lots of them, right, Benoit? Yes, we do have. Uh, I didn't went into details for the duration of the registration, uh, but it's very different from one country to another. Uh, I think it's more important to stress and highlight the acceleration cooperation program. You were mentioning uh, PPH, Patent Prosecution Highway. We also have it uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, more specific to us, to our region, is ASPEC. Uh, the Asian Patent Examination Corporation. It's like a regional patent work sharing program uh, with nine uh, national IP offices, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Mal Malaysia, uh, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. And uh, well, it's basically sharing examination results uh, between uh, IP offices and tr at the end, uh, saving costs and time for the IP uh, owner. So it's a great program. Very quickly, other very uh, national um, in initiatives. Uh, you have uh, 12 months file to grants and IP fast track in Singapore. They also have a lot of, of uh, uh, sector uh, industry related uh, fast track programs in Singapore. Uh, Re-registration recognition of patent in Cambodia and what we call the re-registration recognition of patent in Laos. These are very technical um, systems, but they are, they exist and it's good to, to know about their they existence. Exist and they work, right? Yeah. Yes. Which is perfect, which is exactly what we're looking for. China, you said, Matthias, they had some bad luck. They are, well, actually have to deal with tons of applications nowadays. So can we benefit from something that may tackle this? Sadly, there are no general uh, way of accelerating the process. The only exception uh, appeared during the pandemic. Every technology related with medical devices that can help to fight COVID-19 can be go through an accelerated process. 
But besides that, we don't have any any way to do it. So that's a pity. <laughs> And very consciously, and I was a little bit afraid to ask, Japan already does things fast. Is there really someone who's asking for faster um, proceeding? Or <laughs> granted, oh, proceeding? Yeah, it, it does happen more often than you think. But um, yes, Japan recognizes the PPH, Patent Prosecution Highway, and that's one way of doing it. Um, as you mentioned, in other jurisdictions, if there's a particularly environmentally beneficial uh, patent application or some other policy issues like like uh, earthquake-proof uh, designed buildings, for example, these kinds of things are often um, very seriously taken in Japan. So those could apply for accelerated examination. But there are also some other more generally applicable ways to apply for acceleration. Um, in inventions that are already commercialized, those can be accelerated. Um, ex inventions that are already filed in other offices, whether they're granted or not, those can be accelerated under certain circumstances. Um, SMEs, so small and medium enterprises, individuals, universities, public research institutes, those can be accelerated. And that can drive the time from filing to the first, app, first office action from initially it would be about nine months. That can drive it down to about two to three months for the first office action. So that can um, you know, speed up an already reasonably fast process, but yeah, two to three months, can't complain at all. Which would be pretty logical from the business perspective if you, the break, speed breaking neck uh, technologies they're handling it should be launched to the market. You cannot wait that much. That makes sense, but sometimes they face this, they have to face this bureaucracy barrier which is what we're trying to tackle. Um, we spoke about a lot, a lot information. I know I'm aware of that. So don't be worried about that. You can ask us afterwards. And we have tons of IP guides and materials in our websites. By the way, we have a patent protection guide on Southeast Asia, also in Latin America, and also in China. And I hope there's going to be one in, in India too. So just go to our website, check it. And if you don't find something that is so specific to what you need, just go ask in, uh, ask us and use our helpline, which is exactly what it's said for three working days. And you have your answer. Now, anyway, um, maybe we are taking for granted that everybody knows that there is no global protection. Okay. Uh, from... Mr. Woods's presentation, the level of the audience should be a little bit up, but this is something that is a common misconception because it does not matter how many you have. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Musk, because you must register on a local basis. It doesn't matter, country by country, at least where you aim to operate, of course. That's the theory. But when you hear that China has four jurisdictions what does it mean exactly? Does it mean that there are four different IP offices or there's just one, but the IP rights are granted for the four jurisdictions? It means that we have four different IP offices. There is one for mainland China, there is one for Hong Kong, Macau, and one for Taiwan. So each jurisdiction is absolutely independent. And if you want to be protected within the whole territory of China, you will need to do four different jurisdictions. Of course, the, the CNAPA, the, the National Office of, of Mainland China, has agreements with the other offices like Hong Kong and Macau. So you can kind of go with accelerated processes once you have, you have the IP register for mainland China. For, the, for Taiwan, there is no this possibility. But technically speaking, each office is independent and you will have to go with independent um, registrations. And there is something else to highlight. When, when we see that China is part of the international agreements, like the Madrid Agreement or PCT, only mainland China is a member of those agreements. So hmm. when you are registering through one of these international agreements, you are registering only for mainland China and not the other jurisdictions. There are plans for Hong Kong to join the Madrid Agreement, but however, that still is a promise and not a reality. Okay. Now in Latin America, it depends on the type of IP right. Um, patents, yes, is it's a set. But trademarks is a little bit different because in the Indian community of nations, which covers Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador, if you, for example, register in one 
of these countries, you are granted a position and registration rights in the other three. So it's the closest you can get actually to the European trademark. And I heard rumors about something similar in Southeast Asia, but I'm not sure if something is about to crystallize. Is it, Benoit? There were several times uh, discussion in run tables uh, and uh, well, for the moment, nothing, no unitary or regional system, uh, neither for patent nor for trademarks. And uh, it's actually one of the most frequently asked questions for trademarks, uh, why there is no such regional trademark system. And I think it could also help a bit uh, to protect the whole region in once, but well, no, so far, no, nothing, uh, nothing concrete. I hope the policy officers there are of these of these stakeholders, the relevant the authorities who are listening to us may take note of this and push a little bit so we can get that out. Now, let's stay with trademarks. I, I mentioned that on purpose because maybe we should have started with this because unless you are bond, the rest of normal people don't reveal their names in the last place. They normally do that first. And yeah, maybe we should have started with this IP. I know. Okay. Now, why do I say this? Because this is the IP right that protects the name, of course, of your company, but also of your start product, your method, and many, many, many more. In fact, Mr. Wurzer already mentioned the John Deere logo. We saw that. Now, my question is, is it really so important to register your trademark in the destination countries before you go? Matthias? Yes, it's extremely important. In the case of, of China, we have the, the reality that bad faith registration are still one of the main problematics. So if you enter the Chinese market and you start becoming famous, you will be copied. You will be registered. Someone will register your, your trademark. And uh, sadly, the chances of, of recovering back the, the trademark is going to it's going to be not so easy and it's going to be very expensive. You can wait for a long process. In the meantime, someone else will be capable of using your, your trademark. Um, and also you have to, companies should understand that when we are talking about the company name in China, there is uh, what we call the Chinese name, which is a translation of the company name into Chinese characters. It is a very common scenario in which Chinese consumers recognize the brand more by their Chinese name rather than the international name. So if you don't give to yourself a Chinese name and you're working with the distributor, the distributor will give you a Chinese name in order to make it uh, easier to distribute in order to get more clients, to get more, to, to get your, your product to be known uh, easier. So that is also a trademark. And if you don't do the registration, then maybe your distributor or someone else will do that registration. And in this case, it's going to be even harder to overcome that bad face registration. Oh, I see. Well, you mentioned this Chinese name. I think that this is a little bit similar to what happens in the rest of Southeast Asia. But I'm thinking of the many scenarios you can face. What do you mean with Chinese name? The way that you pronounce your your international name and it sounds to something similar to the to the local uh, translation the translation itself um benoit I'm, well, I'm really sorry for chinese chinese consumers uh, reading our alphabet sometimes it's not easy the same way for westerns reading the chinese character is simply not possible we, we, we just see the characters and we don't know how to pronounce it Something similar happens to, to Chinese consumers, to some a sector, of, a significant sector of Chinese consumers. So what, when I talk about the Chinese name, what I'm saying is just uh, getting the name of the company and translate it into the Chinese characters. And this translation can be done in two different ways. The, the most common one is doing a phonetical translation, which just replicate how you pronounce your trademark by using similar Chinese uh, characters. Uh, the second possibility is not always possible, but if your trademark has a meaning, has a concept, then you just translate that concept using the, like a, a language simple translation. Um, companies choose this, this Chinese name 
it's not so easy and we normally recommend to go with an, a marketing expert because each character is not only how you pronounce, it's not only uh, the phonetical sound, it also has a, a, a meaning, it has a, a concept behind it. So you don't want to have negative concepts, negative uh, adjectives associated with your trademark from the marketing point of view that is not smart. So be careful with what characters you're going to choose. I see. So when you are trying to file a patent application, you have to work together with a patent lawyer and a patent engineer. Now, when it comes to trademarks, at least in China, and I guess that also in, in the rest of Southeast Asia, you got to work also with a marketing expert so they can really tell you how evocative this is and the meaning and the perception of the public and so on. It, yeah, it's, that is the ideal scenario. As long as you have a, a native speaker that tells you that your trademark doesn't have a really, really bad meaning, you'll be fine. But if you really want to invest in your in your brand, and if you want to start with a big marketing campaign, well, I would advise you to go with a, a marketing expert. Okay, so if you want to do things right, you got to do this that way. And Benoit, yes. and also the rest jump, of South jump, jump, Jumping on what I just uh, said, Matthias, and there are also some uh, famous uh, uh, worst case scenarios when uh, you have uh, the uh, communication and marketing just launching a trademark in a country and it has a completely different meaning or a very like let's say slang meaning and then you have to completely change and do uh, the work that has just uh, mentioned uh, matthias like thinking of a transliteration either phonetic either change with the meaning uh, here in southeast asia we have uh, local languages for several countries it's not all countries uh, most of the ip offices it was english it's, it's still okay but i would say uh, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, mostly, uh, where you have to really think of uh, local translations. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, would, I would highlight the same thing as Matthias. Uh, I don't know if we're copying a bit uh, China here in Southeast Asia with regards to the trend, uh, but a lot of bad uh, face registration. And then if you not register, if you avoid registering earlier your trademarks, then it's a bit of a mess of time, of uh, energy, of costs uh, to take back the, the trademarks or to just uh, obtain uh, the deletion from uh, uh, the databases. Mm -hmm. Now, something similar, now that you mentioned this meaning, this translation happens in Latin America. You have to be very careful because, for example, I'm, I'm Spaniard. So many of the companies that come from Spain and just simply want to go there, they are in love with the very same brand they already registered here, but they don't take into account the local language differences, the meaning of it. And if it falls within a case of that it goes against public moral, it goes out. I think this is something that happens also in India. You have to be very careful as to the, the translation. In India, in India per se, uh, we don't have any issues with translation. If you are trying to trademark in English and if it's, yes, public order, must be taken into consideration, you can, but English registrations are acceptable and Indian office and everyone uh, accepts Indian English trademark in the sense, in English language. So that should not be an issue. Okay. The Good language per se is not an issue in India. Good to know. Now let's go back to the technology, which was kind of the main topic that we spoke today. And let's jump into software already. Uh, spoke about that, um, Mr. Buta. Uh, explain the situations, the, the conditions in which and how it could be protected. So I would like to know more about that. How do you do that in Japan precisely? Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, Japan is a, a very friendly office or at least a relatively friendly office for software related inventions. Um, and what, what I mean by that is in places like Europe or the United States, there might be issues with subject matter eligibility. Uh, that is to say that uh, regardless of how inventive a software invention may be, you may not even be allowed to get certain uh, patents on software inventions. So in Japan, that bar is fairly low. Yes, there still is a requirement that software inventions have to utilize the laws of nature, but compared to other jurisdictions, that isn't enforced too strictly, but instead, um, the stricter enforcement comes with inventive step. So you can't simply take an existing method 
and that maybe a human would do manually and say, well, now we've done the exact same thing, but we're now using a computer. That will not pass the inventive step test here. So you have to tweak the method somehow. You should add inputs. You should change the pre-processing of your data. You should do something different from that already existing method. But yes, as far as subject matter eligibility goes, that is not a major concern here. And if you look back at some of the uh, the cases that um, were talked about earlier regarding the agricultural inventions, I would say all of those would be acceptable at the Japanese Patent Office because you're doing things like using software to control how real world objects move, like these tractors and combine harvesters, or you're simulating based you're producing simulations which might seem purely theoretical or mathematical, but you're basing those simulations off real world data based on sensors that are based in the soil that are um, used on the farms. So for those issues, I think that uh, Japan would have no issues with subject matter eligibility. That's great. And in India, you are a top tech company. How do you protect software there? Is it patentable? No, no, software, um, I would again check in with uh, uh, Sarvajit. And uh, in India, it's the same thing. Computers, uh, computer programs per se is not patentable, but if they produce in a technical India. effect, as we saw in uh, the examples provided, the patents provided by Mr. Musa Alexander. Uh, so those things, all the patents uh, stated earlier, these would be protected in India. Mm -hmm. It is somewhat similar to the EPO's uh, threshold bar of considering a software pattern. That's it. And in all the 10 countries of Southeast Asia, why are they more close to the European model or more close to the US model? I would say uh, more close to the European. Like uh, per se, computer programs cannot be patentable. Uh, some of the countries have directly mentioned uh, in the IP law, for example, Vietnam, uh, that you cannot protect a VI patent a software or a patent program. And some have, like, are more flexible, like in uh, Singapore, where they will just uh, um, analyze uh, the um, more the, into deep depth uh, the technical effect brought by the, the software. I think this is, well, mm. this is like this. It's my recommendation is always the same is that it will depend on the country. Uh, check the IP law or check uh, the, the practice. And this is why you need to contact an IP expert for these countries. And this is what the help blank is for. And now just to remind you, the rest of the audience, you know, pattern, pr software patterns are really one of the most fashionable topics nowadays. But by default, software is protectable via copyright and is protected upon creation. It's really recommendable anyway to register that so you can have kind of a, a proof of authorship and you can benefit from additional advantages. But now I want to talk about kind of closing the circle. We started with thinking of the mentality, which would be our starting point. And speaking of mentality, uh, was I was I was saying that the European companies do their are very keen to do it all themselves. And it's a little bit intuitive thinking that they may do exploit themselves too. So they, if, and if they're planning to, to exploit, exploit their inventions themselves and everything that they do themselves, it's okay. They must protect it all and, and that's it. But what if they want to exploit it otherwise? Like, for example, granting some licenses. And then they got to take into account also the technology transfer regulation, right? Because there is a tech transfer. And here's what I think things can become interesting. For example, in Latin America, and particularly in Brazil, you must register the technology transfer agreement before the National Intellectual Property Office uh, because this is how you can make the agreement enforceable against the, the rest of the people. And also it's, that would allow you to, the remittance of payments to a foreign country, which is a, a big issue. And finally, to qualify to the licensee or, or the recipient, doesn't matter, for tax deduction. Money is really important. But is there anything similar, for example, in Southeast Asia? Uh, I heard something that it is. I think I will repeat myself again and again. <laughs> Every time it's country by country, 
of mm -hmm. course, you, for technology transfer, you have to check uh, the legal, then the tax regularity uh, landscape. Uh, so contact an expert. Uh, for example, in Vietnam, it's very simple. There are three types of uh, uh, technology um, transfers. Uh, the encouraged one, the restricted, the prohibited. Uh, you also have to register the technology transfer agreement uh, before the Department of Science and Technology or the Ministry of Science Technology. And we also have uh, um, the issue of reverse engineering uh, that is permitted in uh, some sectors and with limitations. And this is the case, for example, in uh, Indonesia or Malaysia. So all this has to be taken into account and, of course, uh, get the more knowledge you can before drafting the agreements. Mm -hmm. What about Japan? Well, I must admit that uh, this is a complicated topic and it's not something I personally have much experience with. However, we do have an expert in Luca who has mm -hmm. uh, mentioned many resources earlier regarding the EU Japan Technology Transfer Help Desk. And so I would strongly encourage you to check those resources out if you're interested. Luca, yeah. please enlighten us. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> let me make, uh, jump in on this. So it, it it really depends, you know, even the very definition of technology transfer, we, we all know, but maybe not the audience, the audience as well uh, as we do. It's kind of a tricky uh, expression because it might mean the uh, pure single limited licensing of a technology from a university uh, <clears throat> to a company to the actual transfer of something that from one country to another. That's, for mm -hmm. example, the, the uh, most common use of the expression technology transfer in the news, if you read the newspaper. So first we have to identify this, and then we have to, uh, of course, there are ways to, uh, for example, register agreements. If, you, if you're interested in, in letting the, the rest of the world know that you have an exclusive right on something that you licensed. Uh, but in general, I would say that it really depends on the contract that you that you have with the with the organization in question. As far as my uh, help this is concerned, we mostly deal with relationships between universities, research institutions, and companies. And then, and then, of course, as you as you can imagine, and also the audience, at some point uh, there are some confidential discussions, negotiations from where we are we are out course because mm -hmm. otherwise we cannot uh, at some point we have to to limit ourselves we have to stay out of conversations otherwise we would not be able to help other people if we are bound by NDAs and stuff, and stuff like that so again also in our case I would say it, it really depends it really depends and this is exactly what your contact details are for if people are a little bit more curious about this well the conversation is still open and if you want to know more you can reach Luca and then they're going to provide you within what they can and answer to all the queries related, particularly to technology transfer between Japan and Europe. Now, um, but what's it something that really shocked me a little bit? You mentioned that there were kind of prohibited um, technology transfer. And if I just mix that with what you mentioned that the Southeast Asian regulation was kind of copying the Chinese one, that um, makes me, that leads us to believe that maybe in China there are also some kind of sensitive, uh, not even just, may, we may say sectors, right? And could it be that the agricultural one that is the one that we're speaking about today may be deemed a suspicious sector? Is there any consequence for that? Well, the agricultural sector is highly unlikely that will be considered strategic. But technically speaking, in China, if you unless you are big gate, if you are big gate, maybe you will have, you will face uh, several problematics uh, and restrictions. But let's say we are not big gate. Um, companies when they are investing in in China and especially if they are planning to enter into some research and development agreement, they will have to basically check two different laws. The first one. It's a foreign investment law, which states which technologies can be owned by foreigners. Um, the technologies can be prohibited or restricted. Prohibited normally are related yeah. with military aspects and foreigners simply cannot own technologies from those sectors. And the restricted ones are those who that, that, that require authorization from the, from the government, which is not difficult to obtain normally. 
but you have to go with this extra step. And then you have to also check the negative list of technology transfer, because if either you are planning to provide the license or to be benefited by the license, you will be again in the same scenario. Some technologies are forbidden to be transferred, so you cannot provide any type of license, or you can be restricted and you need to ask for permission for, for the government. So when you are planning to do any type of technology transfer, please first double check these, these uh, rules, which uh, they are also, I have to say, when, when you read them, they are very, they're very uh, broad. The, 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 the way the technology sectors are described are, are very vague. So you will end up having to, to consult um, or help us. That's what we do normally. If you have any, any doubts about if you need to request for permission or not, you can contact us and we can help you to contact the, the, the authorities and to know more about this, about your particular uh, scenario. This is really great. Simply great. Now, this is taking us to the final questions that I have on mind. And it is, um, we spoke about registration, about protection. But now when things got a little bit tough, um, I'm really curious about how are these intellectual property rights enforced? And what is the ultimate defense, so to say, in these countries? Is the myth true? It does not matter in any new register because counterfeiting is inevitable and local courts won't help you out. Or is it differently? Who wanna open fire? I know I know this is a little bit sensitive. You can just skip the question. In India, it has been um, uh, counterfeiting goods, uh, trademark violations are pretty common, but uh, the courts have been very proactive and uh, any trademark violations can be brought uh, to book and the whole, uh, say the procedure, the whole case can uh, uh, last up to one or two years and you get a final order. And uh, if and when you find some infringement happening, if you can collect the respective evidences and provide this evidence to the respective regional police, uh, the local courts can issue, and usually they do issue certain search and uh, seizure orders, which are called as Anton Pillar orders. So uh, Indian courts are proactive. Uh, there are courts which um, are, uh, there are those high courts, which are very specific uh, and have certain expertise in dealing with patent cases and stuff. So Indian, Indian courts have over time matured and uh, per se, if I have to mention this one court, Delhi High Court has come out with remarkable judgments in the field of IP. So enforcement per se is not an issue, but you have to make sure that you don't get into the phase of enforcement. You protect your brand before entering the Indian market and have all your rights set. If you don't have your rights registered, then an issue arises. No, I see. And Latin America is kind of similar. Uh, that's lots to do. But I guess in Europe, they may complain also about the level of IP knowledge that courts have. For example, in Brazil, they also have a specific IP court in, in Sao Paulo. And something that is really kind of local is that the, the very same um, national intellectual property offices are in charge of deciding whether there's been an infringement. So they are acting kind of not just at an administrative level, but they are solving the problem at the end of the day, which is what matters. And they cannot say that they don't know anything about IP. How is it in, in the rest of Southeast Asia, Benoit? Well, I was I was willing to, to jump and to, to make a connection with something we, we told uh, earlier about, for example, registering trademarks or registering uh, any IP rights. Uh, I think it's a bit similar also in China. Uh, that whenever you have to uh, put into uh, place a administrative action or again enforcement, uh, you would be asked registration certificates, official documents, uh, and they should be issued by a local um, national IP office or local entity. Uh, so if you didn't register your rights before, 
the legal disputes, it's going to be a bit difficult to defend yourself. Um, quick uh, example, for example, the no IP court yet. It's been discussed in the new IP law in Vietnam. Um, and we still have a lot of issues in uh, Myanmar uh, where the IP office and, for example, even official fees have to be set. Uh, well, it's a bit going round and round. Um, but I would say the most efficient is the uh, administrative actions. Also, maybe it will cost less for uh, European SMEs. And the good news is that uh, we will soon release uh, administrative action guides for the Southeast Asia IP Health Desk. So stay put. That's great. Matthias, in China, is it as similar as Benoit presumed? Well, in China, if you are not registered, you have no protection. And even if you are registered, you will, yeah, you will face a very complex scenario, sadly, especially if you are in the retail sector. China is one of the most uh, complex markets regarding infringement. Um, you really know, really need to know the field. You need, you need to know how e-commerce work, how the e-commerce platform uh, deal with infringement because most of the trades are happening there. You need to register your your IP not only with the national office but also with the custom office or the again the e-commerce platforms if you want to be very well protected. Still, if your product is very famous, you will see counterfeits and you will have to struggle. But again, if you have no registration, you have no way of defending your your products. And finally, Sarf, how is it in Japan? As well, IP rights tend to be uh, well respected and well enforced in Japan. Um, you know, patents especially, uh, they start out in the, uh, you know, the JPO, the Japanese Patent Office, and there is an appeal system within the Patent Office. However, from there, uh, patent cases specifically, they'll go to one of really only two district courts. There's one in Tokyo and one in Osaka. And from there, they can even be further appealed to a specialized IP high court. And that's basically all the system is. Um, so the systems that there, um, the judgments, they tend to be respected and the system is well sorted out. That's simply great. Now with this, um, we ran out of time. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for your kind contributions. I think it was really enlightening. We learned a lot about today's topic and now i know there's tons of aspects that we left out but this is exactly what the question is for and more specifically as i see that there are no questions written in the in the questions tab what the helpline is for because this is exactly what we're here for we are at your disposal and here we are here to serve so please use our helpline and our experts will provide you with an answer to all your IP related queries in these territories, particularly China, Southeast Asia, India, and Latin America, within three working days at no cost. Yes, I said that is absolutely for free and of course with full confidentiality. So the rest of the people, thank you very much for joining us today. It was really a pleasure to have you here with us, really enriching and for the audience, you have already our contact details. You're going to receive the presentation, the PDF one in the follow-up email. And anyway, this has been recorded. So you're going to have tons of chances to see the replay and rethink about what we taught and use our helpline. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your kind presence and contributions. We hope you enjoy the show and hope to see you in the next one. Goodbye. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks a lot, Cesar. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.